On behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening and welcome those viewers uh, who are watching online uh, for the live webcast. And this is the second event in our 2019-2020 uh, uh, lecture series. Um, we're delighted to welcome the NTA um, back to Engineers Ireland. We've previously hosted presentations um, from Anne Graham on the draft transport strategy and by Jared Walker on reimagining Dublin's bus network. And they're very much keynote events for us. Uh, so we'd like to invite you after the presentation to um, Cafe Clyde to join us for some refreshments uh, afterwards and maybe catch up with some with some colleagues. Uh, just a few things to run through. We had uh, our presentation on the traffic science manual in uh, October uh, this year, uh, co-hosted with our colleagues in the civil division. Um, and uh, we've just providing engineers in the transport sector with opportunities to keep up with uh, regulation and guidance. Um, the Engineers Ireland Excellence Awards were held last Friday. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of the transport related projects wasn't the overall project winner, but we're hoping to organise um, a few uh, uh, presentations on some of the transport related projects which would be the uh, Visual Control Tower at Dublin Airport, Dublin Port Railroad Jetty, and Fixed Electrical Ground Power at Dublin Airport as well. So um, we're hoping to organise those shortly. Just some key dates for your calendar. Um, from the 8th to the 11th of January this year, the BT Young Scientist Exhibition um, is on. And uh, we've been asked to call for volunteers to help out uh, to represent Engineers Ireland um, on, on a stand there during those dates. So if any of you would like to volunteer, um, please come and see us afterwards. Uh, it would be great to have some, some assistance with that. Uh, in January next year, we will have a, a launch of Intelligent Mobility um, in conjunction with Arup. Um, this is to create awareness, greater awareness of the concept of intelligent mobility and its importance and to gain deeper insights on the core uh, areas um, which would be connected and autonomous vehicles, electrification and greening, systems and operation and uh, mobility as a service. Um, so we'll be developing a lecture series um, around this and we'll be announcing those at the, the launch in January. Um, on the 12th of February, we'll also have a presentation from Jamie Cudden, who's the Smart City Lead in Dublin City Council, um, to bring some of his uh, expertise and innovation uh, and, and knowledge, I suppose, for, for the transport sector to us. Um, Engineers Week runs in early uh, March, and we always run our annual uh, roads and transportation seminar um, in that. So that will happen on the 5th of March this year, and we're hoping to run it on the on the theme of, of climate action, which was uh, President Marguerite Sayers' um, theme for this year. Um, so we're, we're trying to develop uh, topics in relation to that. So that will be, um, that'll be a good event. It books out very quickly, so please keep an eye out for the notice when it goes live um, on the web page. Also, the theme for the national uh, conference this year is Engineering Climate Action. Uh, mitigation, resilience and adaptability and that will take place on the 23rd of April uh, 2020 and our AGM will be on the 20th of, of May next year. Um, this evening we're delighted to have a presentation on Bus Connect's infrastructure programme, uh, a planning process status update. Uh, the lecture is being co-hosted with the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation um, tonight's lecture uh, is given by, by John Fleming, uh, Bus Connects Infrastructure Director uh, with the NTA. John is a fellow and chartered engineer with over 35 years experience in project and program management of major roads transport schemes in Ireland, United Kingdom and the United States. The Bus Connects Infrastructure Dublin program will upgrade 16 core bus corridors to achieve bus priority, enhance pedestrian and cycle facilities, and the presentation will cover the BCID delivery structure and current status of the planning process, including a summary of emerging route plans, proposed construction strategy, and the pro uh, public consultation challenges. Also speaking this evening is Con Keeley. Senior Project Manager with the NTA. He's a chartered engineer with a master's degree in urban and building conservation. He has a postgraduate 
uh, qualification in project management and environmental engineering. He's an active member of Engineers Ireland and is Secretary of the Heritage Society. He specialised in the development of urban transport schemes for the past 15 years and has spent the last four years working for the NTA on development of the Bus Connects infrastructure. Um, and he's responsible for project managing half of the bus corridor schemes, including the development of the preferred route option, bringing the schemes through statutory <coughs> approval process and implementation on site. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our speakers for this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good evening, thanks very much. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to come talk to you about Bus Connect's infrastructure program uh, and I'm delighted that Con is able to help me out as well because he's been around this a bit longer than I have and uh, he'll, he'll talk you through some of the detail. Um, what I'd like to do is actually show you a little video to before we get into the main uh, part of this, if I can get it to work here. Uh, it's a video that I only just came across myself this morning, but I think it sets the scene very well about uh, uh, public transport in general and um, th this particular uh, freedom of the city theme. Uh, hopefully this, this works now and the sound works with it. We're not still too familiar with this area. Okay. So we're gonna take our time. And keep going because you're doing well, aren't you? Okay, yeah. You're super confident with the cane, I'm impressed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, impressed. My name is Roger Flood and I'm a travel assistant for Dublin Bus. I work with people with disabilities and the elderly, and I teach them how to travel independently. The bus is on its way, I can see it coming. Okay, Roger. Okay, so we'll be ready to go in a second. Okay. Okay. It's more than a job, it's more than a talent. What Roger has is a gift. With Ashling, he gave us a huge sense of her independence that she could be a young woman, and it changed her world. I really like Roger. He's just, he's just the best. That's it, Martin. Focus, focus. He really gave me the freedom to be able to go on my own on the bus and meet friends in town on my own. <laughs> and just being me again. He doesn't really take any thanks for what he does. So he'll really be shocked and surprised when he sees what's ahead of him today. A lot of times for people with disabilities, you feel like you have to live with other people's terms, but he does everything on your terms. Hand right is on your left. All the way up, use your cane, use your cane. That's not doing your job. That's going above and beyond anybody's job description. Roger will be shocked. I'm going to love every minute of this. Well done, Roger! Yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> Hello, everybody! As much as I'm aware of people's disability, I've never once noticed it. It's always been the person that I've worked with. Hello! How are you? He once told me that he put himself under blindfold and taught himself how to use a white stick so that he would understand what it was like for someone without any sight at all. Who does that? Who on earth has that much dedication to their job and cares that much? It doesn't just help the person who needs the assistance. It actually helps the whole family. He'll go to the ends of the earth to help people. I believe Roger really deserves recognition for the job he's done. It's life changing. I'll be in touch, right? Just the... <laughs> Holy Jenny, Rich. I just love to work. Sometimes I hear people complain and they're nearly crying because they have to go into work. But I'd be the opposite, I'd be nearly crying coming home. I sound like you just meet so many superstars. Listen, I haven't got a clue what's going on. Okay? I honestly don't. He is the world to me. He has opened up the world. Hiya, buddy. How are you? He has given me a part of my independence that I didn't have before. There are no words to explain how grateful I am for that. Roger Floods, as a man who has given the freedom of this city to more people than I ever could, I want to thank you on behalf of the people of this city. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm so lucky to teach people how to travel independently, and I just love being part of that.
There we go. I kind of thought that, that would set the scene very well uh, because uh, I think. Sorry, I went wrong here. Uh, it's it's really what what is public transport? It's it's giving people freedom to make choices. Uh, and I suppose what Bus Connects is really about is we recognise we need to make it better for a city like Dublin. Uh, and uh, that's really what Con and I are getting up in the morning to do right now. And uh, so we go out there helping us with that. And I think you're starting to understand what uh, what it is. And there are some challenges, but uh, it really has a, a fantastic reason for for being. So I'll uh, I'll try to run through this. There's a lot in Bus Connects. I'll try to run through it quickly. Con is going to get into some of the detail on some of the corridors, some of the highlights of things that we are considering at the moment. Nothing you're going to see right now is finished or set in stone. It's still an evolving process. But um, it's just to give you an overview, uh, a status update or such. Uh, so I suppose start, what is the NTA vision uh, to provide high quality accessible Sustainable transport connecting people across Ireland. It's not just about Dublin, but beyond this, I'm just going to focus on Dublin for today. A few key facts. Um, uh, the, the bus passengers in the greater Dublin area uh, grew from 141 million in 2013 to 177 million in 2018. So uh, people are using the buses in greater numbers uh, as the economy has improved and as the population grows. Uh, what's notable, though, is um, there's a very high success user rate uh, at the canal cordon of around 69% that, of people that cross the canal uh, are on public transport walking or cycling. Uh, however, when you kind of stress that out across the greater Dublin area, if you like, if you if you were to take that out to the M50, uh, about 54% of, 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 of um, uh, what do you call it, vehicle movements is still by car. And uh, that's translating into congestion. And those of you that uh, travel through the streets as a pedestrian or a cyclist or on a bus or on a car, you're all experiencing that in one way or another. And it's a big challenge. Uh, the bus system of all the public transport systems carries two thirds of all the passengers every day in Dublin, three times what Lewis carries and four times what the Dart and commuter rail carries. So improving the bus system is essential to improving public transport in Dublin. And I suppose a, a big theme for us in the way we look at this from the transport planning point of view is we're looking at the movement of people uh, rather than the movement uh, of vehicles from the point of view of uh, public transport. Uh, and, and you'll see where I'm going to with that as, as I get further in. Um, where are we coming from uh, in, in Carol's um, uh, introduction? She about, mentioned about uh, Anne Graham presenting about the, the Greater Dublin Transport Strategy. So. That's the driver for Bus Connects. It's the driver for the Metrolink program, uh, project, and DART expansion, among other things. Um, so that's kind of the, the policy basis, if you like. Uh, this slide is it's a, kind of a summary of things. What's the program aim? And this is Bus Connects in general, not just the infrastructure part of it. It's to achieve an efficient and effective short to medium term program of changes to the bus system in Dublin to improve travel for existing and future public transport customers to maximize patronage. Uh, the desired outcome is a public transport system that is faster, more reliable, has higher capacity, is easier to use, reaches more customers, and is more efficient, providing better value money for, for all of us. Uh, the case for change, big picture, uh, the growing population. We are projecting a 25% growth in the population in Dublin by 2040. Uh, there's not any more room for cars, so we've got to figure something out for that. Um, the cost of congestion, there are some remarkable numbers there. Uh, 2012, 358 million would have been the cost of lost time. Uh, by 2033, that's estimated to be 2 billion per year. Uh, we've 2 billion of a budget to deliver bus connects. So that's kind of puts it in context. And, 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 and we've, uh, so it, it's an expensive cost to everybody uh, when, you, when you factor it, when you measure congestion in those terms. Climate change, uh, don't need to say too much about that at the moment, it's in everybody's mind. Um, Greta from, uh, from Sweden, is it? Uh, she has really raised the consciousness for all of us, so there's a challenge there for all of us. And uh, certainly, you know, I feel that public transport is a big part to play in, in trying to uh, manage that uh, transition. 
the current network, uh, the current frequent bus network is entirely radial and no longer efficient in, in so many ways. Radial means, and, and you all that use the buses will find if you need to go somewhere, you're here and you need to go over there, you tend to have to go to the city centre, change a bus and come back out. It's very efficient, inefficient. There's not a lot of people in the city centre on the bus that don't really want to be there. So Bus Connects on the services side is, is, is trying to introduce uh, a much better uh, orbital system that will interchange with the, the radial system so people have better choices and don't have to be where they don't want to be. Uh, and that in itself frees up capacity in, in other areas, particularly in the city centre. So um, doing nothing is not an option. I think that's the bottom line, what this slide is saying. Um, bus Connects, the overall program, uh, there's a, many parts to it. Um, the core bus corridors, which we're focusing on tonight, is just one, one element of it. It's an important element, but it's just one element. Uh, the re redesign of the network bus services uh, is a very important part of it. And uh, you'll be aware that there's public consultation going on about that at the moment, second round of consultation. Uh, there was about 30,000 submissions the first time around. So Dublin people are pretty passionate about their buses. They'll tell you how bad it is, but then they'll tell you, make sure it doesn't go away and that it gets a bit better. So people don't want to give it up. They want to use it. Um, we, we need to make it work better in so many ways. Uh, we, the ticketing system, uh, the, 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 the cards are slow when you're getting on the bus. You're waiting for that beep. So if we can speed that up, it gets people on, the, on and off the buses quick, more quickly. Uh, we want to move to a simpler fare structure and get get away from cash um, and you'll see in, the, in in London now you can use your, your credit card uh, rather than needing the Oyster card so we're, we're, we're trying to work on those types of technologies to bring that along as well. Park and ride is an important element of the strategy uh, the, 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 there'll be new bus livery as part of this to, to branding it uh, bus shelters uh, and the bus stops are being upgraded and ultimately, we, wish, we are hoping to get to uh, electric buses. Um, we're in transition towards hybrids at the moment. Uh, the big challenge for the electric part of it is that uh, for double-decker buses, the technology isn't there to run the batteries long enough for the type of routes that we run in Dublin. Uh, there is electric buses in other cities, but they don't have the, the length of route that uh, our bus drivers have to, have to run. So that, that's still in development. They tell us it's maybe three to five years away from that technology. But the, the goal is to get there in, uh, 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 shortly. So Bus Connects, why we need it to address congestion? I've already touched on that. It's all it, Buses are a facilitator. They're not an end in their own right. So it's to enable population growth. And I've added in sustainably because we want to try to get to that place. We can't keep expecting everybody to be able to get to where they want to go in a car. There's not enough room for that. Uh, allow economic growth. It lets people get to work and get on with their, their lives and hopefully get people able to get to work in a shorter time uh, so that they've, they can get home earlier and have that quality of life going with it. Uh, there's a big challenge with uh, housing developments, uh, trying to get that uh, more sustainably working and addressing climate change. So um, the, there's one kind of core objective that I suppose that I come back to all the time, the, what we're trying to do with the, the infrastructure part of this, and it's to give commuters a reliable, sustainable choice by getting the buses out of the congestion. We're not going to fix the congestion. Bus Connect is not about fixing the congestion problem. That's, uh, that has to happen by other means, if you like. People have to make new choices. What we're trying to do with Bus Connect is to give people those choices, and a lot of the people that today use their car to get from home to work, but could use public transport, might be more inclined to use it if it was reliable and if, if it was going to uh, be uh, more efficient. So that's our challenge. Um, and this, you know, it, it's a very good graphic. It gives a, It's back to this thing of moving people rather than vehicles. You can see the space that 60 or so cars take up there. Uh, that uh, Taking all those people just fills up one bus. So you can just see the, the road space that could be freed up for everybody to move around. And that's how you start to help the congestion problem. Um, the benefits for bus users, uh, the reliability, I feel, is the most important part of it. Faster is important. Time savings are important. But I think it's the reliability. If you, if you have to be at work at 9 o'clock, you can't be kind of uh, hoping that you'll get there at 9 o'clock 80% of the time because your bus probably doesn't appreciate that. 
So rather than you have to get up earlier, if we can make it reliable, well, then you can you can be within a plus or five, minus maybe five minute time frame. Um, and if we can get the, the reliability and the time savings working, the existing bus uh, fleet that's there will actually be able to get to their destinations more quickly and get back into the system again. So you'll improve the capacity of the existing fleet before even adding more to the fleet. And the Bus Connects wider program intends to grow the fleet to meet the demand once we have reliability and, 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 and the journey efficiency working. Um, there's also benefits for pedestrians in this program. We want to look at getting the footpaths wider, uh, better bus stop facilities, and better awareness of the disability needs. And it kind of goes back to that, um, to, to the, the video there. Uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a segment of the population that really rely on, on public transport more so than maybe we realize. So it's very important for all. Cycling is a very important part of this. Uh, you know, if we're doing all this infrastructure upgrade, it's right to try to make sure we can get the cycling part of the, of the network that coincides with that upgraded at the same time so that we, we do it all together. It's more efficient and it's an important part of the overall strategy. And uh, we're, we're going through a lot of urban centres. Uh, you know, we, we certainly, through our consultation, we've been reminded that there are a lot of villages and communities uh, that we're carrying our, our corridors through. And, uh, and, and we, we recognise that and we are endeavouring to um, you know, look at the urban landscape and look at the urban realm and see what we can do to help and enhance those areas as part of the programme. Uh, communities live, work and socialise on these corridors, so we need to be mindful of that. Um, okay, at this stage I'm going to head over to Khan to take us through the more technical parts of it. Thank you, John. Um, well, good evening everybody. I am going to try and give you uh, a whistle-stop tour of what amounts to the 100 miles of city streets uh, and some of the changes that we're thinking about making on them. Um, first of all, if we have a look at what we're trying to achieve here, which is uh, this is our ideal cross-section where we would have a segregated cycle track, we have footpaths, uh, we have dedicated bus lanes, uh, dedicated traffic lanes. Um, and to achieve this is not, is not easy, you know. Uh, a lot of the streets are very constrained. Um, you're talking about having to widen roads into certain places. Um, uh, we're reducing a change in the way the traffic moves around, a reduction of street parking and uh, removal of trees. Uh, so where this is, a, we are also explore, exploring other options as well uh, in terms of just bus priority, bus gates, uh, one-way systems and whatnot um, to try and free up the space. If we can actually achieve, you know, the, the ideal cross-section as you see there, it, 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 it does provide us with the ability to manage traffic at junctions. Uh, it does provide the ability to get the buses past the congestion. And it also makes maintenance and um, uh, it would also have another advantage in terms of if you had to roadworks and stuff, you can still provide bus priority through roadworks. Uh, but that's not always available and we have to look at other solutions. Um, so one, one such solution would be uh, a bus priority signal, we call this, um, or a queue relocation facility, whereby uh, you uh, yeah, got it in here. You have a constrained park where you can't get the bus lane through. This this doesn't show a bus lane in the opposite direction, but it can work uh, the other way. And uh, you put in a set of signals. You stop the cars and let the bus get through. So that's in theory the way it works. Um, clearly, this won't work everywhere. There are issues with trying to deliver this. Uh, you need to be able to keep this bit free of traffic, uh, so the length that you can do it, um, you have to be able to flush this bit out, you know, this bit out of traffic, you know, if it was fully congested here, this traffic couldn't clear, it becomes an issue. So it's it's not that easy, but it's certainly one of the tools in our, in our army that we are exploring. Uh, other such ones would be a bus gate, uh, it, it, this is College Green Dublin bus gate, uh, this is an example in Cambridge. Now the difference between these two is uh, this one has enforcement on it, and we have to we, we have to we have to look at that, uh, you know, um, because compliance with with the bus priority signal, uh, bus priority is uh, you know it's it's really is a uh, quite an essential element uh, 
to get in there and we have to address that or we'll try and address that um okay so so what are we thinking of doing in terms of infra infrastructure well we've taken our strategy and we've uh honed it down to what we call 16 core bus corridors and they're numbered from the malahide road there number one in clung griffin you've got swords coming to city center uh Ballymon, Finglas, Blanchestown, Lucan, uh, Liffey Valley, Clondalkin down as far as Drimna. Uh, number nine there is Green Hills on in as far as Christchurch. Uh, Kimmage from the KCR in uh, and uh, Tala in as far as um, uh, Temple Oak or Terenure rather. Um, Rathfarnham city centre, uh, Bray. All the way into the city centre. Uh, an another route then starting UCD, which links down into um, uh, comes down to Bagot Street uh, again. Black Rock in uh, Black Rock in as far as Marion, and the final one then is Rings End, which is really substantially dealing with the uh, North South Keys and providing some uh, cycle uh, cycle priority a bit further as well. So. I'm going to try and describe some of the changes that we're thinking of here. Uh, sorry, uh, we've got 16 corridors, but we have uh, joined them together for 12 schemes. So uh, the likes of Finglas, the, the blue ones have been joined together, and that's li likely to be the way we'll lodge these to onboard Panola uh, when we're going for our roads order. And we will be doing this under the Roads Act. Um, Okay, so these are the southern ones. There's quite a bit happening on the south side uh, in terms of uh, there's some very, very, very constrained parts on the south side. Uh, there are some very unreliable bus journey times, hugely unreliable bus journey times. And, um, you know, we, we have quoted uh, in our brochures, you know, we've quoted a, a 95th percentile of uh, a, an up to journey time, which is the 95th percentile, which is the journey time if you're taking a bus um, every day, if you're taking a particular journey every day, the 95th percentile would be the journey time you would experience one time in 20 or once every four weeks, uh, which is kind of a kind of reliability that you need to be in that space or better, really. 80th percentile is once every five days. You know, people can't afford to be late once, once a week, you know. Um, so I suppose I'll start. I have another slide further down here, which describes cycling, but I'm just going to kind of address the whole lot in in, uh, in a few things. So you're just going to have to bear with me here. Uh, okay, so we start number six there, Lucan. Uh, so Lucan uh, on into the city centre. This will go down um, uh, the chapel is a bypass as such. Uh, a big element of this is trying to get, we are now looking at trying to get improved cycle facilities along particularly we're now looking uh, very much at a two-way cycle facility on the segregated two-way cycle facility from Chapel Izzard, uh, from the top of Chapel Izzard, uh, uh, from far side of Palmerston really, out as far as uh, Woody's Junction. Um, to achieve that is, is quite challenging, um, so uh, we're, we're looking for ways to do that and we think we can get there. Um, Another aspect of this is to introduce at Liffey Valley here uh, a bus interchange facility between uh, buses coming through the Liffey Valley Shopping Centre and um, the, the main route there. That will be a busy interchange facility and we are looking at how to tie pedestrians in across the, the, the main uh, N4 as it is there and uh, bring it on in. Um, other interesting aspects, uh, like I said, we'd be on the Chapel Lizard Bypass. We're looking at introducing a bus stop on the Chapel Lizard Bypass to pick up people in Chapel Lizard Village, another challenging uh, aspect of that. Um, I think, uh, uh, okay, moving on to Liffey Valley. Uh, big interchange at Liffey Valley Shopping Centre, uh, which would be a big improvement there. Um, coming on down. Uh, we are fairly constrained through a small section in, in Ballyfermot village itself and we are looking at uh, uh, basically uh, 
it's it, it's a one way effectively so inbound as so buses will be permitted through this very center of Valley Farm village inbound and cars and buses permitted outbound and we can maintain the cycle facilities through Valley Firm Village. Um, we are doing something similar when we get down as far as Grattan Crescent. We have posed widening the road through Grattan Crescent. Uh, we met quite a lot of, uh, we had quite a few meetings with local group residents groups there uh, from Inchicor and uh, in consultation with them and we looked at alternatives so we would actually put in a, a, a one-way or a bus gate as a, a single direction bus gate at Grafton Crescent um, which means that we can still provide that get the bus, bus priority but cars would have to uh, divert there's a few other changes associated with that to make that work um, but uh, that's currently something we're looking at and then uh, one of the more contentious ones is down here at uh, Mount Brown which is uh, at the Children's Hospital, um, James's Hospital, Children's Hospital down there. Road is particularly constrained there and we are looking at putting a bus gate there so we're taking through traffic that out as a through traffic route and uh, we have to look at how we get local traffic in and uh, that we would still, under the current plan we would um, uh, we wouldn't affect traffic approaching the Children's Hospital. Um, so uh, and that's so we're again we're talking to the locals on that again back out to Tlindalkin and Tlindalkin is tied in with the Green Hills scheme here but Tlindalkin um, in it's fairly straightforward um, it's in on the Nanga Road some pretty good priority there comes down the Nace Road and um, we would have to provide new facilities on Walkinstown Avenue and it ties in with the Green Hills scheme down here one of the big things that we are thinking of here I don't know if you're familiar with it but we call it the hamburger junction uh, which is the junction of the Long Mile Road and the Nace Road uh, it's very difficult for pedestrians and cyclists to negotiate that at the moment uh, in fact if you wanted to cross from I don't know if you know it but if you wanted to cross from Woody's straight across the road you have to push the button nine times to get across that road uh, on any of the roads, the, 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 the quickest one you can get across the pedestrian is you know, take you three goes. On the other two arms, it will take you four goes to get across. You go from island to island to island and across. And uh, so that's a very busy junction. The Lewis is there. Uh, so we're looking at putting in a, a structure that would segregate the uh, pedestrian cyclists from the motorized traffic beneath. Uh, okay, so right on Green Hills here, number nine on in uh, we need to get an interchange a very busy interchange in here on uh, in Tala uh, in uh, up in the square we come down Green Hills uh, we're looking at our realigned which was previously approved I think uh, from uh, at Calmount we're down through Walkenstown roundabout uh, and on one of the uh, and in Crumlin village itself here it's particularly constrained and uh, we had quite a few meetings with locals again here and we are looking at introducing one of the queue relocation facilities uh, to try and get around that um, one of the aspects of this you know like I mean while in places we're talking about taking gardens but we would stop short of uh, hopefully or attempt to stop short of taking gardens to the extent where driveways would no longer be usable uh, for parking off street parking, you know, particularly at family homes. Um, we recognize that there is a need for a family car. Um, and one of the other aspects here, which is probably shown on another one, is uh, in terms of cycle routing through here, this is also constrained for cycling. So we have an offline cycle route, and we're uh, having listened to cyclists uh, that we are looking at trying to provide a cycle link, uh, segregated cycle facilities down Tlaher Road, which will provide a, a big desire line uh, for cyclists, uh, which would meet up with an improved cycle, uh, improved cycle facilities along the canal. Um, let's see, Kimmage is the next one. No, Tala, Tala Terenure. Um, the, uh, uh, Tala to Terenure uh, runs along what used to be the old N81. Um, the biggest, two, uh, there's two big constraints on that. One is uh, Temple Oak Village, 
uh, where we were looking at trying to widen that originally. And we are now looking at alternative arrangements, which with bus queue relocation facilities. Um, and we're also looking at uh, coming down into Terranure Village. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Terranure Cross, but it's a very poorly performing junction. Um, it doesn't work really for, you've got Temple Oak Road coming in, you've got Terranure Road East coming in, and they're all effectively trying to get in through one lane through the village, uh, through the junction at the village, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work for anybody. Um, so uh, we're looking at removing uh, the inbound traffic uh, on Temple Oak Road, and we're looking at various means of, uh, you know, how traffic would get around through that, and that should improve the operation of that junction a lot. Um, further down there, um, we uh, are looking at alternative. Um, sorry, uh, now I'm on to uh, Rathfarnham here. So Rathfarnham City Centre. Uh, this is one of the. This is particularly constrained along here. Uh, there's a lot of protected structures along the way. Uh, there's we're going through villages of uh, Terranure, Rathgar, Rathmines, and um, uh, following public consultation and having our de having looking at a more detailed route, uh, more detailed analysis. We are looking at. Uh, uh, rerouting cyclists in a couple of locations, and uh, notably New Bridge over the Dodder. Um, we're looking at uh, one-way systems uh, down uh, Rathgar Road, and even more radical than that as well, to remove the true traffic out of Rath Mines completely. Uh, access would still be maintained. There's a whole series of, of means of doing that, but uh, to take uh, Rath Mines out as a uh, as a route into the city. Um, so uh, that that's quite a that's quite a big one. And uh, there's also alternative cycle routes, and we can provide cycling facilities and bus facilities, and still maintain access to the village. Did I do Kimmage? I didn't do Kimmage. Did I? I miss Kimmage. Oh, sorry, uh, Kimmage. Uh, can't can't forget Kimmage. Um, Kimmage is also a particularly constrained corridor very constrained corridor and it's difficult for cyclists it's difficult for buses it's difficult for traffic and uh on kimmage we uh proposed originally when we came out to introduce a bus gate on the lower section of lower kimmage road uh, i take it out as a through route for traffic and uh following consultation with locals and looking at that again uh, we're looking at possibly extending that further uh as as you know ex extending the bus gate the two bus gates which would include uh, a little bit more of lower kimmage road and at the same time we're looking at alternative cycle routes uh, both quiet ways and uh, off route that would uh, take cyclists all the way down to the canal and beyond um so uh so that's quite a that's quite a big one there and you know we're mindful that uh, we're, we're looking at traffic restrictions both in Kimmage and in Rath Mines and in Temple Oak and in Mount Brown and uh, it's quite you know it's 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 quite a lot it's, you know it, it, it you know we, we are aware of it and uh, we have to manage that um, Shank Hill all the way so the next one is Bray all the way into the city center uh, this is down through Donnybrook I don't know if anyone came through Donnybrook today but Certainly, Donnybrook was tailed back from the canal all the way out to the far side of Donnybrook this evening when I was coming through it. Um, uh, the, uh, there is some good bus priority along this route already, and we're trying to enhance that. Uh, one of the more contentious ones is from the Lachlanstown roundabout out to Bray to deliver that extension on up through Shank Hill. Uh, we've had a few meetings with people in Shank Hill. And we are looking at uh, various alternatives in terms of queue relocation facilities, uh, or cycle routes. We are also looking at um, uh, trying to maintain a lot more trees. So, uh, I'll come back to trees, actually. Uh, and um, from there, uh, so uh, we hopefully will come back out with a, you know, something um, that 
that can show that we can, you know, we're, we're maintaining the setting in thing while still while still providing for cycles, still providing for uh, the bus, and still providing for local access. Uh, number fourteen is UCD. Uh, the route from UCD, which picks up at an interchange in UCD, there'll be quite a, quite a large bus interchange in UCD, another one of our interchange locations, and that route will go on down, uh, come in through uh, Balls Bridge and down uh, uh, down towards Baggett Street. Um, again, we're looking at uh, means of of reducing impacts on Nutley, and again on uh the marion road as well so uh we're looking at q relocation we're looking at a few other options there um and black rock then the coming in from black rock in as far as marion so that's down past uh marion gates and the final one then is rings end what we're calling rings end uh this is really we're looking at means of getting cyclists up and down the keys we're looking at getting full bus priority up and down the keys um and we're looking at alternatives now particularly on on the north keys to try and deliver the full bus priority um some of these corridors are pretty poorly performing um you know uh swords express will tell you that 50 percent of their journey time is from here into the city center it's uh, you know it's just notes um, so uh, something has to give. Um, I think that uh, I, I mentioned trees. Well, it's it's been a big issue for us uh, taking trees. So we're looking at means of mitigating that. We are very conscious, and John has showed some uh, public realm schemes. Um, uh, we are very conscious that this project will stand or fall on the public realm. You know, this is what the city is going to look like in 30 years' time. Uh, you know, this is, you know, so uh, it's not a heavy engineering. Heavy engineering is just not going to cut the mustard everywhere. You know, we have to look at intelligent traffic systems. We have to look at various alternatives. We have to provide for the uh, life in the various villages around the thing. We have to provide for people to, uh, who live along the routes um, and people indeed who travel through it. Uh, some of these routes are very highly tourist, uh, particularly, say, uh, you know, uh, the end of Liffey Valley scheme down at Christchurch uh, comes into Christchurch uh, down around Thomas Street, James Street. We're looking at better means there for uh, providing more space uh, and um, uh, making making it easier for pedestrians to get around and cyclists to get through. There are particularly bad junctions down there. Um, okay, north side. Um, yeah. Okay, number one is. Uh, so in Griffin, and that's basically the Malahide Road. Uh, it kind of is hanging in space here down in Fairview, and that's because we've got a bit of. Uh, how am I doing time wise? I'm. We've got five minutes for this. Okay, I won't take five minutes on Griffin anyway. Uh, so there's uh, there's a further scheme, the Clontarf Cycle Scheme, that carries the bus priority on and on down to the Keys. Uh, so this is Malahide Road. Uh, Malahide Road is substantially has pretty good bus priority, so we're trying to improve the priority at junctions along here. Uh, we are looking at and uh, and it's also a busy cycling route. Uh, so the biggest change in Malahide Road would be continuous cycle facilities, and uh, that's particularly difficult to provide on a couple of locations down at Dunny Kearney and also down at Marino, which is down the bottom. And we've been talking to residents in Marino about developing a quiet route. And we think we have a solution down there now as well. Next one over, Swords, the city centre. Again, uh, a lot of this, uh, with the exception of Santry, has pretty good bus priority on at the moment. Uh, we just need to improve it at junctions. And we need to improve the cycling offering. Some of the cycling offering along here is pretty poor. And uh, pedestrian offering as well. So uh, we had to come out with a one-way option in Santry and diverting traffic. Uh, having talked to various residence groups who are now probably deciding to widen the street at the lower end of Santry to provide uh, for two-way traffic and uh, we also have to cater alternative for cyclists along the route. Uh, Ballymun, uh, out far side of, uh, out north of uh, Griffith Avenue, it's a fairly straightforward scheme, it's a lot of it's adding cycling, there's a lot of room there already. Uh, it gets a lot more difficult when you start coming down through uh, Moby Road down through Fibsborough and uh, we're looking at uh, a bus gate one-way system in 
Mulby Road, and uh, we've been talking to people in uh, people in Fibsborough and public realm schemes down there uh, on alternative cycle route through, um, which is in our cycle network plan, and um, we uh, we're now looking at grade separating that at North Circular Road as well, while providing connections to North Circular Road. Um, Finglas. Uh, again, Finglas has pretty good priority on it at the moment, um, and uh, we have to. We're looking at new layouts down here at Hart's Corner, and we're looking at uh, reducing impacts on trees further out the road. Uh, Blanchestown, uh, the big one in Blanchestown, big interchange in Blanchestown, um, very big interchange in Blanchestown. So uh, we've been talking to the shopping centre about that. Uh, Blanchestown Town Centre, and the biggest impact in Blanchestown is how to get down through Stony Batter. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, it's very constrained, it's an old village, um, it's been there for a long, long time, um, The uh, and the streets are narrow. So we are looking at removing, we came out, we've schemed to remove through traffic from this area here. Uh, alternatives Routes we're looking at, you know, alternatives, uh, and we're looking at routes for cycling. Uh, we have had some discussions with uh, with the residents groups there as well, and business groups and whatnot. A lot has come out of that, and we're developing uh, uh, schemes with them, public realm schemes, or outlines kind of schemes to see what would be, uh, you know, what would be best suited for them. Um, I think I've covered all of them here, have I? Did I miss any? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this, I said, uh, I've already discussed this slide, but this is some of the cycle options. And it's very important to say that um, we are delivering, we are affecting 100 miles, 160 kilometers of city street here. Um, we are delivering a lot of cycle priority along it. Uh, there's very, very few sections of this where our so, uh, cycle facilities don't align with our cycle network plan don't align with the uh, with the bus corridors it's just the way it is and um, uh, a notable exception that would be Walkinstown uh, Road but um, generally speaking we're looking for segregated cycle facilities where we can provide that uh, we then look at uh, alternative routes are taking the car out and providing the facilities so that's the kind of space we're in and we're just very conscious that uh, you know, like I say, it's all about, you know, we are affecting an awful lot of villages, we are affecting a lot, a lot of residents, and uh, we have done a lot of consultation, and we are making quite a few changes on the back of that, and um, we're trying to reduce our impacts. But at the end of the day, as John says, if we can provide reliable public transport services, and some of them are horrible, so, some of the stories are horrible, uh, of people try, trying to get through, uh, one particular car or journey of two and a half miles. Uh, someone complained to me that their uh, uh, that their bus journey time to get in for nine o'clock in the morning varies between twenty minutes and an hour. Twenty minutes and an hour for the same journey. You have no idea what you're doing. Uh, we can't buy buses for that. We can't schedule drivers for that. You know, if you're standing at a bus stop, people, more people come to the bus stop. Bus gets full. You can't get on it. Uh, you know, you're reducing services. Throwing more buses at the network is it will happen, but it's pointless, you know. Uh, so, anyway. Thanks, Mark. Right, and uh, I suppose as you can get the general gist, it's it's a complex project. There's a lot involved. Uh, we have we have a structure developed, and we're pretty much there at this stage with it. Uh, so I'll just run through that very quickly. The legal context, um, I suppose, the NTA has. We've, we've now taken the road authority powers under section 44 of the Dublin Transport Act. Uh, so uh, the five local authority areas that we're affecting have, have basically uh, agreed that we will take this forward as an NTA project, which means the contracts with our, our service providers are with the NTA and the construction program will be administered by the NTA. We will carry the projects through the planning process and make the CPOs and all of those types of things. Um, we have uh, our structure, uh, the, the overall structure, we have, there's an overall governance for across all the Bus Connects program, uh, those many parts that I, I, I outlined to you. 
Uh, our part of it, the infrastructure part, uh, we have a, a, a programme board um, working through the Director of Transport Planning Office, that's Hugh Cregan's office. Uh, within our own team, we have about 25 people. We're just waiting one more project manager to join us in a few weeks' time, and we'll have our full complement. That's also made up of a, a team on the communications side who are doing a fantastic job. Uh, handling that side of things for us, keeping us on our toes, and uh, we have our technical team, and we've put together uh, the, the service providers teams, and we're working very closely with the other NTA internal departments uh, who have an important role to play in all of this, uh, and obviously we have a whole lot of stakeholders to work with uh, from government, local authorities, and right across the spectrum. So um, that's come together pretty nicely. Our schedule, very broad based, um, our, we're, we're, we're still in this consultation stage. We are planning to get back out for a second round of consultation, outlining uh, a lot of these issues, uh, these uh, improvements from the first round. From the, uh, the first round of the consultation, we got about 10,000 submissions across the 16 corridors. A lot of very useful stuff. Not a lot of stuff that surprised us a lot from the various discussions we had. But as Khan has outlined, we're, we're, we're looking more closely now at these alternative measures that involve less impact on, on front gardens and uh, ideally less impact on trees and that type of thing as well. Um, so we'll be back out uh, in the first quarter of next year for another round of consultation with our preferred route options uh, set out. Uh, and then uh, we're getting into the, the, the full statutory planning process with a goal to, to bring all 12 schemes to on board Planola uh, next year. Um, uh, and with that in mind then, our goal is to um, bring get, go through the oral hearing process. We haven't had the discussion with the board yet. Uh, I'm sure they're not going to be delighted when we say we're going to land 12 schemes on you at the same time. So we have to have that discussion. But um, uh, it, it does mean that really from 2021 through 2027 is the period we're hoping to be out there building these projects. Uh, we're not going to build them all at the same time. We shut down the city. So we, we're working currently on a construction strategy that's going to phase those, probably starting about three each year, um, and uh, not side by side, obviously, so we can manage the traffic. We have to develop the construction strategy. It's still, it's still in development with our, our designers, uh, and we have to take on board the service, the services redesign that's currently out of consultation. The intent is that will be rolled out before we build all these corridors. So we need to sequence things with them as well. There's a lot of moving parts involved. There's obviously the Metrolink scheme coming along as well. who are going to dig a few big holes along some of these streets uh, that we'll have to work around. Uh, so a lot, a lot of challenges and a lot of other schemes going on as well. Uh, we estimate that each project would probably take about two years to construct. So it's a matter of phasing. So some of these hopefully will start in 2021. Some may not start until 2026. So how we present them to the board may get staggered along those lines as well. That's still to be developed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've been allocated a 2 billion euro budget on the National Development Plan through 2027. Um, on the quality side, we have the NTA project management guidelines, which sets out the gated approval process that we're working through. And with 12 schemes running broadly in parallel, uh, using four design teams uh, from our consultants, uh, there's a lot of, uh, it, we have to work, putting a lot of effort into creating a collaborative framework so that we get the consistency across all the projects. Uh, as we present to the board, we need to ensure that we, 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 we can show a seamless interaction across the projects and that they've all been planned on the same basis. Um, just a quick word on our service providers. Um, we, uh, we've appointed four engineering designers uh, with three schemes each across the program. Uh, but we took a view that we would separate out the environmental impact assessment and the transport impact assessment from the, that those roles to create an overarching uh, single uh, service provider role for that because uh, as you're well aware the cumulative impacts of these projects across each other and bringing in, in the likes of Metrolink and other things into it is a huge logistical challenge for us. So the EIA and TIA is taking the cross city holistic view. It's probably kind of unique in, in effect we're doing an environmental impacts assessment of the greater Dublin area. 
uh, and trying to pull all those pieces together. And then we'll basically cookie cutter that up into 12 schemes, 12 EIAs for, for, for each scheme, both with the cumulative impacts taken on board. Um, other service providers that we have on, on, on the team is CIE property are helping us with the referencing work for, for the CPO process. We have Chandler KBS who are uh, advising on the program cost management side of things to watch our cost estimates and stay within budget. We have McCann Fitzgerald on legal advice and uh, we, there's a lot involved there. Uh, and then we're currently concluding an appointment of a land valuation uh, service provider as well. Um, that should be sorted out fairly soon. I think we're in the, in the, the final parts of that. Um, a quick word on stakeholder engagement, and I know we're running out of time, and I want to leave time for some Q&A. Um, it's, it's, Con mentioned it a lot. Uh, we, we started the process really last November. We had a round of, first round of consultation that lasted about seven months. We phased out the, the, the 16 corridors over that period uh, to, to manage the logistics of it. Uh, uh, when we did publish our brochures um, back over that period, uh, we were identifying potential impacts on properties and things like that. So we took a view that we would write to the people uh, living in these properties to make them aware that there was a possibility. Now, it wasn't a CPO letter, and we weren't, didn't want to frighten people, but we did want to encourage uh, them to come talk to us and to hear from us directly, rather than the hearing it uh, through the media or something like that we were planning to take a piece of their front garden. And that has worked out very well because we got a lot of one-to-one -one engagement with these people and got to understand a lot about what they're about. And that continues right through. We're still doing that even as we speak. Um, we also have gotten a huge amount of value in talking to residence groups. Uh, and we meet small represent representations uh, from local communities uh, on an ongoing basis. We have two this week, we have three next week. It's an ongoing process. It's proving very valuable because they uh, they're, they're engaging with us, uh, they're finding that we're listening, which surprises them, even though I, all of you that are involved in this type of business know that we do listen uh, and we do try to figure out what people are concerned about. Uh, but it's proven very useful and they're coming up with very useful ideas that uh, we're able to take on board, so it's a very helpful process. Uh, we are, we've also put in place a community forum for each of the corridors. Uh, and this goes back to, it was set up originally for the Dublin Port Tunnel when that project was in planning and construction. And it just keeps the local, this is a combined uh, uh, forum for all the residents groups on the corridor to have a representative come to an evening meeting that we run. We give them an update on the project and we have a Q&A. And it gives them an opportunity to stay involved and to hear what's going on so they don't have to wait long periods. And it just avoids an information vacuum. Uh, and keeps people, gives them the opportunity to feel involved. Um, the public information events, uh, the public consultation process itself, we'll have a second round of that. And that gives the wider public the opportunity to come meet us one to one at these open events. Uh, we've obviously ongoing liaison with government and the local authorities. Even though we've taken on the powers, we're setting up liaison uh, teams with each of the uh, um, local authorities to work closely with them because they're going to be handed back these projects when we're finished. So we want to ensure that uh, it's, we're, we're, we're in it together. That's in, in the process of being set up now. Um, and then the media, uh, you know, it, it's there, it exists. Uh, we're working in the public sector. These are public sector projects. Uh, public funds are involved. So it's, it's only fair and proper that we, we uh, have to engage with them. And the best thing we can do is ensure that they have the facts and uh, hope that they uh, report uh, using those facts. Uh, but it's, it's part of the, of, the, of the process. And in a healthy democracy, it's a good thing. It keeps us all on our toes. So that's really it. Um, I, I suppose we'll open up to Q&A. Thanks very much. Uh, sorry, um, thank you to John and Con. Um, we will open the floor to Q&A, um, so if you'd like to take a seat over there, and um, if you just ask if you could just raise your hand, um, we'll be able to pick out a few a few questions, and please just, I'd say there's a, there's a good few questions, so um, we'd appreciate it if, if we can get through as many, as many questions as possible. So is there anyone that would like to, to kick off the, the questions? Yes. Um, Keith Elliott, uh, retired. Um, my name 
in uh, it's about the um, rearrangement of traffic. We've talked quite a bit there about um, the redirecting traffic to allow uh, commercial priority in certain areas. How can you estimate traffic load for that situation? Presumably, you're not going to try and accommodate all the traffic that's there now because part of the whole drive of this thing is to reduce the level of traffic. Do you have to make some sort of assumption as to how low that traffic load is going to be in the future when you're working out the alternative route? Sorry, just for online, that was just a question about how, how do you uh, estimate traffic? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, well, we, uh, as part of the, the overarching uh, service provider role, we take down the controls uh, and we look at the transport impact assessment of the overall scheme. Uh, and like we're fortunate in, in the ETA that we have this Eastern Regional model as the baseline to, to do the traffic assessment work. Uh, but we, it, it is that, like as Khan outlined, some of these corridors, like for instance, Kimmet and our car, we're putting very significant constraints and there will be a lot of diversion there. I suppose our, our, our goal and hope uh, is that a lot of people may uh, transfer modes and start taking the bus and start cycling if uh, they are satisfied that it's becoming more reliable. Uh, but we, are, we have our TIA people, our transport impact assessment people, who will be looking and modeling these impacts. Uh, and that work is ongoing at the moment. We don't so that, that, that actually traffic comes to give it as we speak. Get the data updated. Uh, but we will in the spring, we'll start to see uh, what that's starting to look like. And um, you know, where we believe we've got a working uh, structure coming together, uh, we're still open to the, to the, the possibility to even act there. We'll that because um, it is going to change the, the traffic regime. Uh, there are business people still need to get about their business. The vans and the trucks and everything else that have to do deliveries, they have to go about their business. We have to ensure that we don't shut that down as part of this. So there's a lot of work done in that area, and we do have to carry out that full assessment. And that will become part of all the environmental impact assessments and support that we want in the scheme for the two folks. Sorry, don't look here. Sorry, just don't offer anything. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Yeah. First of all, Tom Miller from TII. I'd just like to commend and compliment John and Tom for a very informative presentation on a fascinating project. Mm -hmm. I, I hadn't realised that the €2 billion Euro budget that you've allocated is mean, it's extraordinary when you think of that, you know, that scale of budget. And I, I suppose it bears testing the importance of the project. Just mm -hmm. one of the things that just wasn't clear, um, and maybe it's part of your next phase, your consultation, but it was. One of the strategic benefits or what I'm sure I'd be getting with the, the provision of the interchanges to address orbital uh, movements around the city. But from the maps that I think you put up there, Con, I couldn't gauge where the actual interchanges were going to be located. But just to get a sense as to you know, the strategic benefit that is going to be derived from it, but I think we're all probably in agreement that it is very easy to get in at the city centre, getting around it, not so, not so easy. So just, I don't know if that's something that's still a work in progress. Uh, and presumably the interchanges in of themselves would require land take because I presume there's some fairly radical uh, uh, development required for, for some of them will be particularly busy or I think you mentioned one of Blanchard's town is going to be a, a particularly important one but uh, just wondering if there's any more information on, on that side of things or is that something that's going to be dealt with the next day of the consultation? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, when I mentioned interchanges there, they were the main uh, a lot of them are terminal route interchanges, but at the same time, you have these orbital routes that cross the radial routes all the way along the city. You know, so it's not it do, the interchange doesn't just happen at. Um, so, for example, at some point you can come in, say the Rathbarn corridor, you come come down as far as uh, Sunrise or KCR, or, and you can interchange. You can move orbitally around the city. It's, you're not interchanging at. at uh, uh, it's just an interchange of uh, bus stops will be located close to junctions. We look at the accessibility, can people cross the road, can people get around. This is legible. And um, so there's a lot of interchange will happen between modes. Um, one of the things, like, it's, and it's not just between bus, you know, we're picking up the Lewis, we're picking up the uh, dark expansion, as John mentioned, um, we're picking up the rail lines, we're picking up the bus. Uh, we've been picking up metro in places as well. Metro gets done, gets done out. 
And um, one of the things that, that, that facilitates this, just the whole interchange thing, is that we're likely to be introducing, say, a 90 minute fare for the bus. You know, hey, you, you, you pay a 90 minute fare, and you can interchange then between any mode within that 90 minutes. So you pay one fare, you get on. This is huge. Uh, if, if, if people don't really realize what that means. It means that if you're getting the bus down through Ragdar, you can pop into the house, get back on the bus, and go. You can drop things. You know, it, it makes it much more. You know, the, with this system, there's a lot more interchange in it. There's no penalties. Uh, but to answer your question about the interchange, there are major serious interchanges uh, at those locations that I mentioned: UCD, Blanche, uh, and, and so on. Um, but there's a myriad of interchanges throughout the network there as well. And they're all being addressed. I suppose just uh, in regard to those four particular ones, the UCD, Blench, so Pella, and uh, Nicky Valley, uh, we're working very closely with the, 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 the owners and the developers of those shopping centre and uh, UCD campus, because they have got their own master planning going on at the moment as well. We're fortunate that uh, they're, they're, they're in that mode the same as ourselves. So, um, Diffy Valley in particular is ahead of the, the, the pack on that in that they've gone for planning uh, as part of their overall um, master plan changes and redevelopment with our, our parking facilities. And we've incorporated in uh, an interchange <coughs> bus stop facility in as part of that with a very high spec of a well as well. Uh, in fact, the, the bus service is literally going to go right up to the near the edges of the cinema park with the Diffie Valley. So, and that was that was really they promoting that idea. Um, what was interesting in that is that they are very much trying to encourage the people that work at, in these spaces. And like the Valley, I think that's why it's so like two thousand people work there. They want to encourage them to take public transport, to free up <coughs> our spaces for the the, the, the the shoppers and the users and things like that. So you know, it, it, it's 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 a win win for all parties. So we're working closely with them and. Uh, Contributing towards the, the development in that regard. Uh, so, in, in some instances, the, our schemes would be CPOing the property we would need in these areas if we didn't come to some arrangement like that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Sarah, welcome. Just, I'm a big fan of what you're doing, particularly the mix of cycling for an active mode of transport. It strikes me as you go through your presentation that. A lot of the issues are caused due to um, congestion to private motor vehicles. And I've lived in certain cities for the past few years where great bus service, very few cars, mm -hmm. and amenities that cost a fortune. Have you considered any means or methods to discourage? I mean, obviously, you're trying to, to use the carrot here with a great bus service. Uh, but in your image there, you've got a, a bus lane. Do you consider any other means to remove the motor car that's benefiting kind on, on uh, people parking in the city, jacking up rates on car parking? I mean, congestion charge. Congestion charge, as yeah. an example. I mean, I think that's where you were going. Yeah, it's a, no, it, that's a question we're constantly asked, and it's a, it's a very, very valid question. Uh, I, 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 where we come from with that is that it's, uh, if we were to stay introduced congestion charging yeah. right now, uh, it would really be a penalty on car users because we don't have a good reliable bus service as an alternative. So there is the there is the carrot and stick involved. Yeah. Get get the get the service up to the quality and the reliability that, that we feel is, is fair and reasonable. And then if people are still waiting for their cars, maybe that's the time to introduce the, the yeah. stick part of, of, of the equation and get it within the time of the parking and things like that. But it, it needs it needs uh, at least the one to have the first, and then we, we go into that. You could call it that would be the next step after 2027 if, if the results are shown. I appreciate you. Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not second guessing your yeah. approach, but by then you will have set up many lanes, you will have some CPOs and people's gardens by then, and you may not have needed that space. Well, uh, I, I'd like to think you're right. I'm not sure that it will work that way because yeah. uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to extricate people from their cars if that's what they always done. Yeah. But um, it, it, I, it, I suppose it's just back to that thing that, you know, how do you get, it, it, it's a penalty uh, you know, otherwise, and, uh, you know, it might be unfair to everybody. They, if they don't trust the bus system, why would they use it? 
and of course the law. The other thing is, um, you know, businesses still have to go about their business. People, if somebody wants to get walked into the house, a tradesman has to get their property and things like that. So we have to, we still have to ensure that uh, the business travel is, is within and, and walkable and as part of this. So it's a balance. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, you're next. Yeah, um, yeah. Kevin Carter from the Golden Kingdom Coalition. Um, one big project was was announced that was the mission to the um, what they were calling us. Um, and, and I assume those would be similar to the same as here. Um, is there a time scale or anything for those? Is that going to impact the end of the network? The new one, you know, the addition to the new one, the new one, the new Is there any? It's, it's, it's in the strategy, it was part of the strategy to do similar work to this on the offices, but um, based on the budget that we had and the timelines and things like that, it, it really was taken to stick to radio from first, and then we did some work after that. So um, it may not be, we may start that process sooner than we can see in terms of the planning of that, but it's just a matter of, it's the logistics of staging it all, you know, the reason for time and the budget. So it is intended to do that as well. Yeah. Do you know um, cycle, so are cycle plans like the Fitzwilliam Euro has been delayed because of the <coughs> planning um, of that? And is that going to be, once the public consultation is over and the line is finalized, will those projects that are continuing? Uh, you know, but, uh, there is, we're dealing with 100 miles, 130 kilometers. Uh, there is many, many, many. Projects going on all over the place, all over the city, a lot of them. Um, you know, we're, we're going to uh, each place, but we're not we're not stopping other schemes, uh, and we're looking currently looking at how to buy in to the Fitzwilliam. Uh, the Fitzwilliam is likely to keep up with the pace, is likely to uh, uh, be delivered, and we will work with that. Uh, we're all in favour of it. It doesn't change anything we're doing. Uh, we're not going to change it. Uh, it's kind of it, it devil is always in the detail, and that's how much you can do now. You, you know, you have to come up with a, a, a logistic. You don't, you don't, you don't want to do something that on one scheme that, that prohibits another scheme. Yeah. So there's, there's quite a bit of thought uh, process that they put, uh, but no, we're, we're, we're not stopping. And there's lots, sorry, there's lots of other projects like that going on around the city, and you're saying anything that's currently in planning, we're not saying stop. Uh, because what we get from working all the approvals of any of these projects, none of them are happy. Yeah. So we're not going to stop anything that's already going on. We are trying to work closely with all these other parts, and like the, the, the lot of those schemes have been funded by the UCD anyway, so it does talk to our colleagues in the cycle, and uh, their first side of the house, uh, <coughs> so it's ensuring we're compatible with it. I have a question up here at the back. Hi, my name is Sean Ward, I'm retired. Uh, I, I wonder is the ambition of, of Workplex far too modest? I, uh, in the southwest of the city, that stretches from, let's say, the Crumbling Road, Kimmage Road, Tanner Road, Balfarnham Road, that whole area of the town. At the moment, there are 60 buses going into the city at the moment. On the bus, there will be 66. 10% increase, right? From the point of view of trying to get people out of their cars and move to the bus, <coughs> that's out of provision for to do it. And you find in all of these corridors there are actually pinch points, right? Where it doesn't matter which land taking you put in, these are prominent buildings that are not going to be demolished, you know. I don't for say like Charlie Muir, the bonds both, you know, for James Joyce and everything else, that's not going to be demolished, and that's the pinch point. And so is there a fundamental problem here that 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 one makes can deliver a certain amount but really can't get the most shape of the city? Um, um, it's a fair question. Uh, I, I suppose the, the overriding thing is that if we get these infrastructure um, improvements put in place, uh, and like I said, we get the buses out of the congestion, uh, then we can put on as many buses as a corridor can take. Uh, so the, the current bus connects uh, services proposal to go from 60 to 66 might sound modest, but that's kind of the current estimate based on the demand that they see in that corridor. Uh, hopefully, uh, the program and, 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 and the <coughs> overall structure will be successful and it will enable the bus services to be expanded or contracted depending on the demand. Okay, well, that's yeah. just a okay. At Paul's public, I know that's only a limited number of buses you can get through there. 
that's 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 true. That's true. Um, but but I suppose it, you know it, it it's it's a balancing act. Uh, it, it's very difficult to without taking out some of these buildings, and that's something we've said from the start. We know that we need to do. We don't want to damage the fabric of the city. We want to you know kind of blend this in and hopefully bring enhancement to it. So it's it, it's uh, it's, <coughs> it's challenging, but you know have to. And we can probably only get a couple more questions in, so um, I'll come to you first. I wish you luck with us. I do have two, I think, two things that strike me. Now, 
for that and then the fact that there is no knowledge is it is it is pretty fundamental to the possible strategy that we can come with uh, especially uh, because of the diversions that we're gonna cause for for the on some of these books uh we have a kind of had a situation where we can start finding routes to neighborhoods and things like that we and we don't want to walk there and start using uh uh, of the physical infrastructure barriers that we have for that as a fact that they are very expensive and not in an ideal way for the problem of the problem. So I uh, think the, the primary force by whatever means uh, is an important part of it and we hope to continue with that. Now I think we have um, a few people in need of refreshment as well so we might just yeah. take a, a final last question. I think did you have one you have yeah, there? Uh, James, the job of uh, you talk a, a good bit about the interventions in the Marina Corridor. I'm just wondering uh, how we <coughs> put it all in gel together in the city centre and what actual interventions are planned to link all the different corridors together in the city centre. Um, I, I suppose we, 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 we purposely didn't go out with the city centre because there's just too many balls in the air at the time. Um, yeah, there's, <coughs> there's uh, the Eastside Group, there's Plaza, there's College Green, there's, there's you know, uh, there's so. Uh, the city centre does require some work. A lot of these things, believe it or not, do get on to schemes in the city centre. <coughs> a lot of them get down to private schemes. And, uh, so there will be uh, more interventions in part of the city centre, largely property management. Um, and the whole thing is being looked at at the moment. Uh, again, the buses through the city centre are still critical. But there are various schemes going on all the time. Uh, you know, various interventions, very significant interventions within the city centre. Uh, that deliver quite a lot. Not that we need to uh, uh, bash your wall, uh, those kind of things that <coughs> make their difference. And there, there's, there's more of those plans going forward. And uh, that's, that needs to happen anyway, but it's just supposed to be a little bit of a more of these words. And if it's a quick question, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, it strikes me that in Windy Arbor, which I used to go into town, that if you, and it's, I'm a golfer, if you were actually able to take the land on the golf club, mm -hmm. a lot of people would park there and go into town. And the same would be true in other golf clubs. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea would be that they were precast concrete done earlier in the year with short jobs, and the golf clubs would get a few bob out of it, but it would also create spaces <coughs> where cars could be parked rather than be going into town. No, very good, very good suggestion. We'll be taking on board. Uh, park and ride is, is part of the overall strategy, and you may be aware that there is a plan to set up a park and ride office in the MTA in the new year. I think that's been learned and it was due to go over the design uh, <coughs> But it's part of the solution. And uh, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you want to take that suggestion back to the golf club, Private <laughs> I know there's a few golfers here who won't agree with me, but I know it's a good thing to do in a normal situation. Provided you do the job in the winter so you don't wreck the course on the street. Just uh, thank you very, very much to John and Con for this evening's presentation, um, and also to CIHT Andy Campbell, the chair of CIHT, is here as well with us this evening. Uh, so it's great to work with other uh, organisations, and I look forward to working with yourselves again in the future. Um, and as well, to maybe you might come back when when you're delivered on on a lot of your your schemes. It'll be great, uh, very positive stories. And um, listen again, we'd like to invite you now. To